Hello, everyone out there in the internet world and land and stuff like that. I know that's just such an awkward intro, but here we are. So this looks a little different, and that's okay. Change is good. So this is an effort to bring you the high quality metagame data analysis that you all deserve right and work so diligently to provide input on this is an effort to do that in a very clean way you'll recognize well the avatar you'll recognize from our man jonathan and then that no. uh, that uh, debonair smile over there with the uh, the discord bot in the background that's our man puzzle uh these two gentlemen are part and parcel and key and core to the mission over here at the new uh, dot guide discord server and associated YouTube where you're watching this right here. Um, Jonathan wanted me to ask, uh, ask you guys to let this run in the background, like a podcast. You're going to be able to see our faces and all of that, but it's going to be less visual than you're used to. Uh, all of the graphs and other graphic related materials are available on the websites. We're going to be talking talking points. There will be stuff on the screen, but uh, it won't be as visually stimulating unless you're looking at puzzle over there. You know, it won't be it won't be the fireworks and all that stuff that you're used to. Basically, it's hardcore nerds. Yes, we're all nerds. Hardcore data nerds digging in, giving you the what's up on the lowdown so with that um at the time of this recording the pdh pod episode with well let's i i'm 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 getting ahead of myself my man dallas how are you i am doing pretty good how are you Clay? doing doing well doing well jonathan how are you buddy yeah, I'm good. I'm great. Ready to get into some data. There, okay, right on. Okay, okay. Kick my. Okay, nice. Good nudge. Good nudge. Okay. So, at the time of recording of this particular episode, uh, the PDH Pod episode with uh, the Hex Drinkers uh, announcing their their return uh, was just aired yesterday. In that episode, they talk specifically about um, our data. I mean. Obviously, we're a we're a we're a hub. We're the heartbeat of the game, right? The meta game. Uh, they were talking about our data and how we were reporting commanders, and they asked the question specifically about commanders that have multiple archetypes. If there's any way that we're distinguishing between one archetype and another within the data itself, and the short answer is no. And uh, Jonathan and I touched touched about this we can talk about it a little bit uh more if you like we talked about this earlier and i think he agrees he and i agree i think uh that uh regardless of the the various archetypes of a commander uh if they are winning then they're still going to be reported under winning commanders so people that are in the know now this requires a little bit of astute formation by people playing the game, interacting with the data, knowing who is playing what lists and that sort of stuff. It takes a little bit of inside baseball, but not much, you know, to know where those particular lists are that are being reported, you know, who's playing them and who's reporting them uh, to know uh, if it is a mid range deck or a control deck or, you know, whatever variant of crackling Drake, you know, whatever flavor, uh, but by and large, uh, and I think Dallas might agree with this as well. Uh, very, very, very few, very few commanders allow for uh, multiple archetypes to be, uh, uh, well, not tried. Everybody can try, but very few commanders allow for a lot of archetypes to be successful. Uh, Crackling Drake is the only one that I can think of offhand that allows for like a spell slinger thing and then kind of like a madness combo version, which is different. Um, now that I prefaced all that, you know? Yeah, I'd like to go on about the Crackling Drake because yep. 
even though you can have a combo variant or a more grindy mid-range variant, it's still the whole shell of the deck is a Voltron deck because that's what the commander is and that's what the text on it does. So I just, I've been listing it as a Voltron deck, even though there might be decks with a combo element or not, it's still one uh, kind of dominating archetype. Puzzle? Yeah. Um, I think there are potential for that to become more of an issue with uh, more mechanics like partner and the choose a background being printed just because of how generic a lot of those commanders can be. Mm. But for now, I don't think it's too big of an issue. Right on. So, uh, as, as demonstrated time and time again, um, we've always been a little bit of reflexive to, you know, with regarding change and looking at our own processes. I think we're always looking at, in fact, we were just talking about process change today, incorporating, uh, the potential for another avenue of segregating certain types of data out. So it's not like, yeah, it's not like change is not going to happen. I think it's inevitable and it's how we're rolling with that. So, but for now, I think we all agree. And to Alk's point, uh, calling him out specifically, uh, he made a comment about if somebody wanted to tank a particular commander, um, they could, you know, submit a report uh, against their, you know, hated commander and, you know, mess with the data that way. Uh, the issue, not the issue, the, the, the benefit of the system that we have now is it would take a lot of effort to create a circumstance where that would be meaningful over the long term. So as we're collecting games, as we're collecting data on gut inspiring leader, you know, that sort of thing, uh, it's the, the ship will automatically write itself. So I'm not, I'm less concerned about, uh, uh, outliers. I'm, I'm less concerned about, um, uh, uh, getting it wrong with regard to multiple archetypes and our commanders. I, I think the way that we're heading, not that it's perfect, no data is ever perfect, but I think the way we're heading is capturing that as, you know, lean and efficient as we possibly can. Anything, anything further? Nothing. That's good. Right on. So into that, you know, like we've, we've, we've reviewed, uh, archetypes, you know, Jonathan just pointed to that. Uh, we're constantly going through this stuff. So, you can sleep soundly at night knowing that Jonathan has your back all the way in Australia. <laughs> mm. <laughs> not, not so much. Right on. So is it data time? Data time it is. Data time. Data time. Hey, getting into the data. Part two, maybe. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we've got a new data wizard in the dot guide server, uh, Bodarn. Uh, actually emailed me uh, via my uh, uh, business email, and he's like, hey, uh, I do this data stuff in real life. Uh, I can help out, that sort of thing. I was like, all right, kid, let me see what you got. And uh, by all means, he is uh, astounded and all of that stuff. So we're going we're gonna to try to hold on to this guy, I think. So credit to uh, Bodarn. This is a text document that he produced, it, uh, produced for us. When essentially uh, just breaking down uh, some trends from the second half of last year and the first part of this year, uh, going through, maybe not reporting exactly the things that we show on the website, but showing uh, definitely some varying trends and all of that stuff. Uh, so without further ado, part two, Jonathan, my man, what do you got? And so looking at the 2022 data over the last six months, uh, Bodan has uh, put a top top 10 list of commanders with the highest win uh, percentages, and he's excluded the commanders with like one or two games that have won both the games and then never seen again. So these decks have been played quite a bit. Uh, so I've got Carter Doom Scourge on 70% win rate, which is extremely high. And this deck was 
really good because of one mechanic, which was the initiative. Uh, back then, the initiative just came out, and we quickly discovered whoever was holding onto the initiative was winning the game. If you had the initiative and you never let it go, that was like a 90% chance you would win the game outright, just via attrition over the long game. And what Carter Doom Scourge did was it just didn't let anyone else take the initiative. Uh, Carter Doom Scourge has an ETB goad every of your opponent's creatures, which just stops them attacking you. So you're sitting on the initiative and the monarch, which were the two the two big things in this meta. And you'll just never let them go and you'll win the game via that. And your opponents would also kill each other just by being forced to swing at each other. Mm -hmm. Easy that win. Was, uh, Nate, yeah, that was Nate Diggity's deck. And he's an amazing deck builder. And looking at the list of commanders, you've got Passageway Seer, Barrowwind. Those were also Nate's decks, and they are also both initiative-based decks, which just don't give up control of the initiative. Uh, the Ore uh, have the color black with them, and black has all these kill spells, all these life drain spells that just stop your opponents from ever touching you. Uh, so then we've got Aesis Fawn Sphinx there, on the fourth best commander, according to the win percentages, uh, which was Noyark's list, which was a a combo deck, but it was a more a uh, grindy mid-range deck as well. So it also appreciated initiative and monarch. And uh, this deck was kind of the meta breaker when it introduced. The other mid-range decks had to become faster to keep up with it because this was this was the mix between mid-range and combo. If you were playing a mid-range deck and you did not have a combo, this deck would be faster than you. There was no outgrinding Aesis Von Sphinx, and there was no counterplay to it either. Killing the commander did not work, countering the commander did not work, countering what they cascaded into did not work, because they'll just bounce the commander, do it again. Uh, then we've got Spitemare, which is what Nate switched over to from Carter, which is his his combo deck. Mm -hmm. And that was that was also a kind of like a grindy combo deck, kind of like Aesis Von Sphinx, where it kind of just sandbagged the entire game and just one out of nowhere with one big combo with a win rate of 50%, which is really impressive. Mm -hmm. Gut and Inspiring Leader. Now, I know we're going to talk a lot about Gut today, uh, especially because there was a bit of a rise this year in Gut and Inspiring Leader. So I'll leave that for later. And then we've got Liara Porter, which is Puzzle's deck. Puzzle, do you want to talk about your own deck? <laughs> sure. Um... Liara is a Boros mid-range deck that just takes advantage of the card draw, quote unquote, and the cost reduction from Liara to uh, cast ramp spells like Bonder's Ornament was a really big one mm. for free to help recast Liara if she died and applied a lot of pressure and benefited a lot from the initiative meta because just puts out a lot of bodies and gets a lot of blockers. So it fed pretty well off of the meta at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So after Liara, and Liara, was, it's also kind of like an aggressive deck, isn't it? Because you kind of flood your board of creatures and able to kill everyone from that. Yeah, rolling And then we've got Core, which is a heavy control deck. Which wins via like pestilence and impact tremors and all the attrition type of spells. It's also a slower deck. All of these decks are they're not like turbo aggro apart from like gut inspiring leader, and they're not turbo combo. Uh, Eastern Sphinx can win fast, and I've seen it win games like turn six, mm -hmm. but that's like that's not what the deck is built for. It's more a grinding, a grindy deck. It was a very grindy meta th this year in 2022. Erin Street Urchin, that was, that was Noyark's pet as well. That deck basically has a Death Touch commander and Street Urchin lets you kill anything you want on the board over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it was very annoying to play against it because you just didn't want to play your commander because it would just die and die. go back to the command zone. Yeah, it was a heavy control deck, and the only problem it had was closing out games because it could kill all the creatures, but eventually you'd run out of sacrifices. But Noyak kind of solved that by putting in some big creatures you wouldn't normally see play, like 
Owlbear, mm. which is just five mana, four, four, draw a card. And those four fours would just win the game because no one else would have creatures and he would just attack with his four fours. So that was also an interesting, an interesting deck. No one had seen like mid range type of creatures used that way before. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, this Copa Guild made with the 36% win rate. That was my list. I was running a, it's kind of like combo, except it doesn't always outright you win the game because it depends. Viscopa depends on certain cards which can gain you certain life according to the board state. Uh, like Congregate gives you two life for each creature on the board. And then Viscopa lets that you turn that life into damage. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those were the top 10 that uh, Bodon found. Now it's interesting Ricardo to was- note... Yeah, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, the reason why this isn't reflected the same way on the compendium page is because uh, uh, they don't meet uh, some of these decks don't meet the uh, the minimum threshold for reporting on that page. So I don't know. I assume there's got to be some sort of uh, number of games cut off because, uh, like Jonathan uh, indicated earlier, we don't have the onesie twosies that have 100 percent win rates and all that stuff so uh you know maybe the cutoff was like five games or you know a couple of games what have you but uh just of note you know you're not gonna see uh borrowing at least i don't think you're gonna see borrowing on the compendium at the moment um no but these these 10 decks i believe have been played a bit i remember playing against all of them a lot of times mm-hmm so I would say, yeah, 5 to 10 is, I think, where he would cut it off. The reason we're not seeing these decks anymore, though, is because Nate Diggity, unfortunately, has uh, stopped playing. He kind of just went quiet in the server. Mm-hmm. He's still keeping his decks updated, though, so I think it's maybe in he's real just life. busy. Yeah, I think it's in real-life stuff. Yeah. So I can't wait to get him back, get him spell-slinging again. Yeah, if you're listening, Nate, this is the universe. Calling your name. <laughs> so, Bodarm put in some notes here. Basically, Carter. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, if you had a pod, this is the fascinating part, if you had a pod with a Carter in it, and you were not the Cardor, then you had a 10% chance of winning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, guess what Clay's Torwaki is turning into? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got the I got the first couple of cards in the mail uh, today. To it make is it. it is worth noting that this is uh, from last year, though. Yes, so yes. This is uh, potentially right. uh, different. Potentially, we haven't seen Carter this year in 2023 yet because of Nate's uh, leave of absence. Mm-hmm. Uh, Clay, if you want to pick up the mantle and start slinging uh, Carter out, I will. I will proudly do so proudly do so i'm tired of getting my ass kicked with the uh, tour walkie so <laughs> yeah tour well, is a very very slow commander yeah carter it, i feel like carter is a bit faster well tour tour requires a play style that is just on the outside of the way that i like to play i like to play fast and yeah yeah uh puzzle do you want to dive into some archetypes or did it did you want to hit that jonathan yeah. Oh, unless you want. I've to. talked enough. I'll let Puzzle speak. <laughs> All right. Well, next up, we've got the uh, archetype analysis for the second half of 2022. And first up, we've got the highest winning archetypes with mid range up 5.3 percent, which is uh, very significant. This was very much a mid range meta. And then control was up 0.23%. So it was doing okay, but not anything significant. And then everything else was losing. Aggro losing by a little bit, 0.69%. Uh, combo down 3.11%. And Voltron down 4.03%. So a lot of archetypes were struggling against mid range. Mm -hmm. and if we take a look and compare those to what was actually popular 
we see the most popular archetype was actually combo at 28 percent so combo wasn't necessarily losing for lack of trying and then you have gretchen (laughs) Gretchen didn't uh run around at this time no at the end was december fairly new yeah um mid-range 23.3 percent representation and then you had control at almost 20, aggro around 10, and Voltron at 8%. So yeah, 2022, so, the end of 2022 is a mid-range metagame. Mid-range is, winter, for sure. Sweet. <laughs> what, is, what is interesting is the combo decks that were doing well were the mid-rangey, grindy type of combo decks. Not the fast, not the... Uh, not the slow, but the um, not the weavers. The ones where the commander, no, not the weavers. No, but the ones where the commanders would either draw you cards or give you some type of card advantage. Mm-hmm. Uh, even creature card advantage, like uh, for example, Noyark's lists, where he he ran a lot of um, like Bear's Companion, the mm-hmm. teamer, the team. Right, I listed that as a combo deck mm-hmm. because. The whole point of the deck was to get Flicker combo out. Mm. And with the commander, you can either make infinite bears or you win with a capsize and wipe the board. The typical, you know, CPDH combo. But that is also a mid-range deck because it's uh, generating value from the commander, getting creatures, and then using those creatures to control the board. Right on. So even though combo may have been winning... It's also kind of a mix between mid range and combo. Like, it's not an outright combo deck, if that makes sense. So, it's actually, so you, you, what you're saying is that, uh, that plus 5.3% is bolstered by its combo parts. You know? Uh, no, I'm saying, I'm actually saying it should be higher than plus 5% because some combo decks are also mid range decks. Hmm. So That's the popularity of 23%, it might actually be 25. It might actually be 30. Mm. Because because mid-range and combo, they, it's the archetypes, they kind of share from each other. Because mm. a combo can go into any deck. Mm-hmm. Like, a, you can put a combo in a Voltron deck, but it'll still remain a, a Voltron deck. Yeah, so combo as a standalone archetype is very hard to justify. Say. Yeah, it really depends on how you're reporting it. Because yeah, I see if I see combo as the archetype, I assume combo is the goal of the deck and they are actively yeah. playing towards that combo and no other win condition, really. Mm. Yes, but then it, they could also be playing actively towards that combo while grinding out value with their commander, which is the mid range aspect. Mm-hmm. Depends on the commander. Yeah. Yeah. Which is actually one thing I wanted to, yeah, it's one thing I wanted to bring up because looking at the other format, which we take from CEDH, so competitive uh, Dragon Highlander, Mm -hmm. all the decks have a combo in it or it's a stack stack. Mm. And even though they list decks as mid range or uh, turbo or whatever they have, every deck is a combo deck. Every deck has a combo in it, but they don't call it an archetype of combo. Mm hmm. And the reason is because we have a life count of 30. So we allow aggro decks and Voltron decks to actually exist because of the lower commander damage. And uh, aggro decks have 30 less life to deal with, 10 life from each player. So that gives us a bit more archetypes than CEDH has. Um, And because decks in CEDH, they don't win with damage unless it's part of the infinite combo. Yeah. Like Godo or Najila. Yeah, unless you're Winota. <laughs> and yeah, that's a stack stack, yeah. right? Yeah. So. I don't. Mm. Should I uh And the, the aggro decks that can be uh that have been seen being played like Gut Inspiring Leader, uh, and then Burn decks, even Loyal Apprentice has been having some wins recently. Mm. This is all twenty twenty three stuff, which we'll get into later, but mm. That's yeah, it's really interesting how we can have all these archetypes just coexisting. Should I at uh, once. should I cover some colors and then we can get into uh, next year? 
Go for yeah. it. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, so um, just kind of looking this over real quick. So Boros was the most winning winningest winningness winningest yes winningest <laughs> we a uh, winningest uh, color combination followed by Rakdos then followed by Orzov. Um, what's surprising about the Boros is that uh, it, it's represented highest here, but it didn't have the highest win percentage because gut. This is pointing to gut inspiring leader and Liara Portier. Ah, that's why because. Uh, You've got a combination. Yeah, multiple. You've and got multiple. Spite and oh, yeah, and, and spite mare. And yeah. spite mare. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. That explains that. And then Rakdos, obviously, Cardor pulling you know huge weight there. Uh, and then Orzov. Look at look at you, Jonathan, knocking it out of the park with a little Orzov action. Now, what's interesting mm -hmm. uh, about this mid range meta from last year? Is that your traditional colors? Is it Simic and straight up blue? Uh, we're underperforming now, as as shown by the 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 combo favored data uh, from the previous like I was going to say slides, but pages. Uh, it's not due to underrepresentation. People were still jamming, which what I assume to be blue X combo something. You know, there are combos in other colors, but by and large, you know, people are playing a combo, usually are blue X, right? So it's not for the lack of playing those colors uh, that they're rated so low because they were actually being played. I think that's a, a point a lot of people like to uh, uh, talk about when they talk about last year and the mid-range meta and how people weren't playing XYZ. So... In fact, yeah, so uh, Rakdos obviously looking at uh, popular colors or colors by popularity. Uh, Rakdos coming in the top, but number two is Is It. So the number two color pairing uh, was the third or, or the, the first negative performer, right? Everyone else was performing above average. Uh, is It was the first one to perform below average, even being the second popular. Uh, color combination, and then wow! Yeah. Is it even is it even a good color? Uh -huh. <laughs> what a nerd! <laughs> but no, I was looking at uh, this Orzov thing, and like even with the the uh, second lowest representation, uh, still having the uh, the third uh, best performance. Way to way to go, buddy! Way to go! That's that's how you uh, that's how you knock it out of the park. It's, oh, yeah. So try to discourage the use of this very bad language, but uh, is it Simic and Blue did very bad. They did less well, whatever that means, right? Do you guys have and anything? Of course, it, could also, it could also mean that all of those colors might have been in the same pod constantly. Like, it's always luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. Maybe they always were paired against Carter, and that's why. <laughs> they kept losing. As, as someone who has always been a uh, combo fan, I I can verify that Blue struggled in the meta, at least that I played in mm -hmm. uh, at the end of this latter half of 2022 because of, as we talked, the initiative. You just mm -hmm. didn't have a great way to take it, and you would just lose value because everyone was... was introducing it to the game. And from a timing perspective, uh, so July would have been probably league round number two, right? We were doing six week, six week leagues at the time, ran, ran by Jonathan. And uh, we were getting like it was uh, it was meant to be experimental. So um, there's a small contributing factor uh, there with uh, the intention of that league season being uh highly experimental uh that you see a lot of like new stuff being honed and tuned and all of that uh as well so uh, just other little factors that aren't reported in this data here that were happening at the time that you wouldn't know unless you live through it that sort of thing yeah, but speaking about the league carter was active in the league and did take a lot of games in that league he ended up winning that league with carter and barrowin they're mm. both the top two decks or 
yeah, one of the top three decks. He's he smashed he it. Play in that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Colors. There you go. Uh, we're gonna skip over uh, predictions, and we'll get straight into the January through March. Now, this is uh, the first week of March. Not this last week. We added some games to the data uh, in the last like twenty four hours or so. So, all right, Jonathan, you ready to take it back up? Yeah, take it back. So, the decks that uh, was it Bardon found the top ten: Scholar of Ages, Dargo, Malcolm, Gretchen, Gut, Inspiring Leader, Witherbloom Apprentice, Composite Golem, Crackling Drake. Rilsa Rail, Ghost Tormod, and Stormkiln Artist. And these decks, none of them were uh, in the top 10 from last year, so we've got 10 completely new decks. So I'll talk about Scholar of Ages first. That deck, it has been seen play in 2022, uh, but the win rate wasn't that great. And I don't want to like point fingers at anyone, but we do have. Uh, new pilots for the deck. So the previous pilots of the deck did not believe uh, the deck was that strong. And then we had a few new pilots. We had Noyark and Be Fine uh, pick the deck up. And they edited a few cards around and managed to actually get the win rates going. It is a pure combo deck where the only way it can win is to combo off. And Mono Blue, all the counter spells in the world, all the ramp packages, all the ar- artifacts with a 70% win rate. And as you're saying, this deck is not listed on the Compodium because it hasn't met the required 15 games, but just a few more games and it'll, it'll get there. It has a lot of games done. Definitely a strong deck. Um, so in this, in this meta, the initiative kind of died down a bit. I think what happened was People started. Exp- oh, I know what happened. Wizards started printing a lot of, lot of cards, and they just kept giving it to us cards over and over again. So this was a very experimental time. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people were experimenting with the new, like the new poison counter stuff. They just kept printing cards, and we just couldn't catch up. Mm-hmm. So new decks would constantly be in played, and because of that, all the old decks would kind of just keep winning. Mm-hmm. Because you no, know, those decks have legs, and the new decks are all experimental. They're still being built. Not to say those commanders are bad, but mm. they're just uh, they're just still being figured out. Well, between between last year last year's initiative experimentation and this year's initiative, because initiative and Monarch are still alive and well. I think uh, we've gotten uh, a, a new influx of. Uh, uh, evasive creatures to the meta, like people are playing one drop flyers specifically to four uh, one skeletons. Yeah, but they're they're <laughs> particularly focusing on evasive creatures for that. Mo- so by making monarch easier to get, uh, not monarch initiative. By making initiative and monarch easier to get, you almost diminish the value a little bit. People are not wanting to play it so much like it's i've yeah. seen it i've seen it focus which is more. why we need yeah we need cardo back because that actually just stops people from getting it <laughs> yeah so uh, coming soon to a theater near you <laughs> no uh yes um um what i was gonna say i was gonna say oh but uh i think last year was the experimentation with what initiative could do and I think in the last like few months, four or so months, it's been more of a, a focus on like trying to to hone the edge of the knife to see how focused it could get. I think that's you know, uh, real surreal. Um, uh, Passageway Seer has been uh, played a lot more uh, uh, this year than it's being represented in this data. But you know, I think people are just kind of like trying to hone the edge of that initiative blade to see exactly how far they can push it, which is why it's not as widespread as it was last year. Uh, the the thing is, because of all this experimentation, people are playing decks which you normally wouldn't see 
in a tournament setting for this format. Mm-hmm. And this does let decks like Gut Leader and Gretchen and Scholar of Ages have an increased win rate. Um, but this isn't always true because I, I was looking at the data and uh, Rusa Rail mm-hmm. and Passage Wasia has been playing a lot of games and they are established decks mm-hmm. and Ghost Poor Mod, but they've all been losing. Mm-hmm. And I have a few theories on why this is happening. <laughs> uh, recently, Rilsa Whale and Passageway Seer have been experimenting with aggro as the archetype instead of Voltron. So all those one dropped creatures that you've been saying. Mm-hmm. So you get a better fight for the initiative, but you guess you get a worse roll off the throne of the dead free from the initiative. And maybe they're just not keeping up with the aggro decks of like gut leader or they're not keeping up with the combo decks because they're running less interaction who knows mm-hmm. and then ghost tour mod i don't know why that's gotten worse I've, i haven't played it recently so but they both have the same amount of games as uh the other decks gretchen scholar of ages and gut leader mm-hmm. uh, they're just not winning as much as they were last year which is surprising man i just realized that number two deck is my deck <laughs> Dark Mal- oh, some other people some other people have been playing Dargo Malcolm getting getting that win rate up good yeah. good I've seen it a bit well it's it's nice yeah. because in in this more strategic uh, initiative monarch meta uh, Malcolm being evasive and Dargo being you know having trample uh, Dar- Dargo is a house like you, the only way to negate Dargo is by playing uh, a plethora of big creatures yourself, like like many big creatures. So it's like, okay, you smack me, boom, I'm smacking you, but right back, you know, taking whatever. So yeah, Dargo is incredibly powerful, and it's it also has uh, one of my favorite archetypes, which is uh, Turbo Combo. Dargo has the fastest combo in the format with Thermopod or with Ashnods and Energy Refractor. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, as yeah. Well as, being, as well as being a Voltron commander, it's also a, a powerful combo commander. Right on. And then number three is Ya Girl. We love Hustle's favorite deck, Gretchen. Uh, this deck is so good. Um, I think this deck's disgusting. Mm-hmm. They can win turn two, uh, turn three. Consistently, it's attempting a win on turn four or five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very fast. It's got a lot of good grind. I think it's very, very strong. And the main reason that I think it does well is because games are going faster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, with like the prevalence of gut right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gator really driving that deck into the ground. Him and Aaron mm-hmm. playing that a lot. And Gretchen is a combo deck that is actually able to consistently win faster than the aggro decks, which is very nice. But you also get targeted by them a lot. So yeah. there's some give and take there. So I don't know where Winter Bloom uh, or Wither Bloom, rather, Apprentice. I don't. I don't know if that's a. Uh, 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 Ryan's exact build. I've heard of people making uh, variations on that, so I don't know if it's exactly uh, the... He was always uh, hesitant to play the Stormy cards, you know, and building and generating his own Storm count and all that stuff, so I just don't know exactly where that list is at the moment, but it's good to see uh, old, old Wither Chad step up and do the damn thing, right? So... Yeah, and I think all with the Bloom decks are v- very similar. It's a spell slinging deck with a uh, you know potential to grind out your opponents. Mm-hmm. So I don't think there will be much different from Ryan's list and anyone else's list. If you add the storm cards, it's just you know free cards to add. Okay. Not much different. Does anybody know anything of this uh, golem? This composite golem? Yeah. So uh, uh, yes. that's one that I've worked on. Rava Rava Mati, is that his name? Raven um, Mati? Just call him Wolf. Yeah. Uh, he's worked on it. I think Jonathan's played it some, maybe. Jeez. Um, am, yeah. I, am, I, am I the only thing, only person that hasn't had a turn with the deck? <laughs> it's, it's Composite Golem fun. is 
it lets you play in all five colors. That's mm-hmm. the reason of the commander. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you Mine get all the best like cards a, in this format. Rix is banishing that curiosity control because I, I love curiosity control and I've played basically every commander for it. Mm-hmm. So I tried a composite golem version that worked pretty well. Mm-hmm. Righteous. Well, I'm, res- I'm responsible for this crackling Drake, well, that I know of. Um, you, uh, Gators played it a bit, but I mm. don't think he's played it much this year. I, uh, if, if you see like Tatiova and, uh, uh, Drake, Crackling Drake pop up and all that stuff, it's, uh, it's me doing that whole reminding the format that, you know, these decks exist. So I'm still playing Tat- Tatiova. So. Yeah, there you go. So I got, a, I got a few wins in, uh, this year, I believe, or the end of last year. Mm hmm. So yeah, I mean, end of last year, we've got a couple. We've got a couple of decks. It used to it used to be that we only had one or two decks uh, in the format that served as the uh, the standard bearers for you know okay the, a good stick for competitiveness. Uh, we're starting to get uh, a nice little uh, squad, a sampling. You know, uh, you know, uh, definitely a handful of good decks that uh can be uh can serve as the uh perpetual you know uh test for any new things coming up i don't know how you guys feel about that uh, i think we're, we're expanding archetypes i think guts up there now gut mm-hmm. leader i think yeah, I mean, we're still, we're still in the experimental phase, and that's that's the thing. Wizards just keeps printing cards, and unlike CDH, where when a new set comes out, decks just don't change at all, or they change like one card. In our format, we change it like up to fifty with a new mm. set. It's mm. crazy. Yeah. So flavor. We haven't settled down yet. Yeah, flavor of the week. Okay, so to round out the bottom there, so real surreal. We know we know who's responsible for that. Uh, that's, that's Ryan is riding that wave. Uh, of course, you know, mentioned earlier, it was a pu- more pure mid range. Now it's turned more aggressive and even has uh, somewhat of a, uh, neat little sly curve, uh, going on as well. So yeah, he's been tuning that to be more aggressive, evasive creatures maintaining and to some degree in a controlled way, losing the initiative just so he can get it back again. You know, yeah, that's dirty. Uh, Ghost of Ramirez, you, you know, and Tormod. I haven't seen this. I echo uh, uh, Jonathan's. I haven't seen this in the meta. So this must be uh, probably coming in for, through some of the uh, the paper metas that are reporting in, uh, which there are several now uh, across the country. And then Stormkiln Artist is one of those decks that... Uh, uh, I'm not saying Travis it's not. He's been playing a lot. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying it's not deserving of its wins. It's just it sits there, it sits there, and then boom, it explodes. So <laughs> play is just yeah, salty because I... in our in our league game, it <laughs> killed him. So were you in that league game puzzle? No, I played the deck a while ago against Clay, and I won because of he was playing Sir Conrad, and he just hit everybody really low, and then I grape shot with a storm count of like nine and just killed yeah. people yeah. and won the game and okay. it was stupid. <laughs> now me and Clay were in a league game and the storm killing artist just suddenly just killed Clay out of nowhere like turn five and Clay was playing Taddy over so <laughs> mm-hmm. he yeah, just it's... lost out of nowhere and then storm Kiln didn't even win that game but taking out a player just out of nowhere like that incredible. I think it's kind of like Zada where it's just like the mono yeah. red volatility of the combo deck where it's like if my commander gets countered i lose mm-hmm. but if it doesn't like the deck can pop off very well so yeah it well, can. i mean goto goto exists right yep yep yeah, it's, pretty it's much similar and it has it has ways to combo off and kill three opponents at once um it did kill clay by just having a big commander with like 30 attack yeah it has <laughs> but it has like reckless fire weaver in the deck so it can kill f- uh, free players at once that so is... it is very powerful all right archetypes archetypes look at combo popping right. off yeah we got a combo 
skyrocketing, especially in comparison to last year. Uh, combo most winning archetype. And then we've got Voltron doing pretty well. Uh, I've been seeing some mono white pop up recently and such. Mm. Um, control still pretty even, close, losing a bit more. And then aggro has been losing a decent bit more and mid range just tanking um in its winningness mm -hmm. and if we look at what's actually popular we see aggro almost 30 percent aggro is very popular right now with gut mm -hmm. uh especially gut leader but other gut variants as well and then we've got mid range still very popular but not winning as much and then combo and then control and Voltron are not represented very often. And the reason aggro is not winning that much, even though gut leader is one of the most impressive decks out there is because there's a lot of other aggro decks that are being run and they aren't as good as gut leader. Like other gut variants just can't yeah, keep much. up with gut leader. Yeah. Six, Six three to uh skeleton tokens. Yeah. Jesus. Our inspiring leader is the is the one where you create a one one uh for each player whenever you attack. Is it? Pretty sure it is. I thought inspiring yeah, leader, leader Inspiring Leader gives plus two plus two to your tokens. Ah, okay. So that's uh, what's the so other one I'm thinking of then? You're, you're thinking the blue dragons, six, right? Yeah. No, there's very... another background which is white. Oh, the one that makes the veteran soldier. Mm. Oh, veteran soldier. Yeah, that one. Mm. Yeah, that one does not seem as great to me. Um, that one gives you more consistent fodder for gut, but inspiring leader just makes you. Basically, with Inspiring Leader, the plan is you have fodder and you just kill one person on turn five. And then your skeletons have built up that you can then go kill the next person turn six and then turn seven. Yeah. So it like swings on the one person for turns three, four and five. And then it one shots the other two players the next two turns. So, OK, so. I'll say this about Gut Leader because uh, Gut Leader is probably the most controversial deck in the format at the moment. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So it has 47 pieces uh, of sacrifice fodder in the deck, which means that with an active gut on the battlefield, you have 47 opportunities of 99 to make 4 1 skeletons. Now, if you're curving out, and you're able to play gut into inspiring leader that's four ones into six threes with menace uh, that are very difficult to block and deal with effectively now how this is how th the trade-off right so you get this good thing there's this trade-off you're basically running a a, a sacrifice deck you know, you're basically stripping your own resources behind you. So if you get tripped up, you know, meaningfully tripped up along the way, okay, well, you you are your game's probably, you know, close to over. Maybe not out, but you know, definitely tempo uh tempo play in a ten turn game uh means something, right? So whether or not, you know, if you're just like a uh, puzzle just said about uh uh, gut leader having a very specific focus on turns, you trip that up just, you know, one turn and then you've knocked that entire game plan off, right? Because you have uh, incidental things like life gain, blockers, you know, all of these things. So, yeah, gut leader. <laughs> yeah, and with gut leader, uh, let's, like, looking at cards that stop it, you have your like common board whites like Fiery Cannonade and uh, Dragon's Breath, but they don't actually kill the skeletons if the uh, background is out. And there's so much in Boros, there's so mm -hmm. much interaction to stop Gut from dying. So many uh, pump spells, so many protection spells. 
Mm-hmm. And gut just stays on the field, just keeps producing these skeletons. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you can kill gut, then the skeletons would die shortly after, yes, but yeah. killing gut the is the problem. Yeah, they have, well, yeah, they have not with a not with a buff spell right, on right. gut. Yeah, but gut dies, and then they still have damage on them when they become four ones, so they die. Yeah, but Boros just has a lot of ways to stop that yeah. from happening. Yeah, it it has a lot of protection, pro color stuff mm-hmm. to just go. Nope. But yeah, that's uh, that's all I have to say about archetypes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right on. <laughs> Okay, so well, one oh. one archetype that we're not, uh, yeah, one thing I want to mention okay. is I have been playing a lot of what I consider a turbo combo archetypes, um, and the reason we don't uh, chart down turbo is because it's we call it we still put it under combo, but the decks I've been playing are like decks that try to win turn three, like it's really really fast. Gretchen, let's go. Gretch, I um, yeah, that can win turn three, but like the decks I'm playing, like have Desk a it. has a average mana cost of one. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah, real. It's really crazy, and that's that's to counter the aggro decks that I've been playing. That have been uh, playing because aggro it kills you fast, but it doesn't kill you turn three fast. So I'm trying to win before the aggro decks, and this could be the reason why uh, aggro has a what negative four percent win rate this year and combo has a plus nine percent it's because the combo decks are just winning faster than the aggro decks mm-hmm. so i just wanted to mention that maybe it's maybe we should start uh listing turbo as an archetype and i was also thinking of burn as an archetype but that's a whole different whole hmm. different story whole different whole different video that's a that's a video onto itself i'll hold you to it yeah sweet okay colors Okay, um, in, in terms of winningness, surprise, surprise, Boros still at the top, but a change. Is it and Blue have moved into the positives uh, to include Celestia, which had never previously been uh, reported, and then moving into the, uh, the negatives, White is actually showing up as uh as an option which i find interesting because that means people are actually trying to win with white you know which is uh probably something that wasn't considered maybe a year ago i mean i i know i've built a a mono white something deck but it never made past you know just testing i never it's the it's the experimental phase all the new cards that was it's been printing mono white is getting a little bit yeah. of a show Still not winning, but you know, mm-hmm. experimental. So yeah, I mean, as far as yeah, it's got a four point eight uh, percent for white, pure white. So, uh, which I find interesting. So Boros is the only thing in double digits for popularity. Uh, everything else is in single digits. Uh, and there's some there's for the first time there's red, white, blue, like. Uh, individual colors versus uh, specific color combinations, which I find somewhat fascinating because of, like you said, probably the individual uh, cards being printed uh, give the perception of, you know, viability and people trying to test and push and all that stuff. So, yeah. Celestia is a sleeper for 2023. I don't know, Bodarn. I don't know. <laughs> Right on. All I right. do like Bodan's conclusion here. Do if you, you someone wants to read it? Yeah, get, not it. <laughs> also, read it. Here. Um, there has been a major meta shift between 2022 and 2023. Black based mid range has fallen, and blue based combo returns as king. I. Bodarn thinks that this is a result of the dramatic increase in aggro popularity. Between 22 and 23, aggro increased from 10.8% to 29.6%. Consequently, aggro is pushing down mid-range and combo is preying on aggro, which we touched on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Based on all-time stats, mid-range and combo are about equally winning, 
and aggro is losing. Unless the format has a major shakeup, he expects midrange and combo to continue shifting back and forth based on the number of aggro decks floating around. In other words, as aggro goes up, midrange goes down, and combo goes up. Conversely, as aggro goes down, midrange goes up, and combo goes down. And control is just in an awkward spot and doesn't <laughs> move much. <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> Amongst all of this change, Boros remains in the top number one spot which he thinks we can mostly attribute to Gut Leader, which currently holds the crown at 46.43% win rate. Yeah. All yeah. time. All time. So yeah. Let's see, there's no more little spicy tidbits beyond that, no? Okay, we'll switch back over to this scene where it's just our lovely faces and not the screen. All right. So... We have entered into the era where rock, paper, scissors is measurable. Yes? I, I extent, guess so. <laughs> so. I just feel sorry for aggro, because aggro just determines if midrange or combo wins, but it doesn't determine if aggro itself wins. And it's that pretty might, sad. That might shake itself out, you know, as... As the meta, because we've got uh, so the the thing that has changed in just in the beginning of the year here is we've had these. Well, you guys know this. I'm preaching to uh, internet internet land out there. Um, we've had a number of in paper metas stand up and start reporting. So as these individual metas do their own techie thing and uh, report on their lists and you know drive the data from their local perspective we might see some creeping influence you know from those because they're also certain members of those communities are also playing online in the connoisseurs uh server so it's not that it's not that these things aren't being passed around these ideas aren't being transferred they are it's just not cur I'm curious how all that's going to shake out with the, because everybody knows paper is a little bit different than digital, and you know you get friend groups together and they start talking tech, and then they start gaming against each other, and then that warps their own little local scene. How much of that's going to be, you know, just one of those things that I'm curious about with this this rock paper scissors thing kind of shaking out. So. Any any parting thoughts there, Mr. Puzzle? Um, aggro is a very interesting archetype to exist in four player. And yeah, as we can see, it kind of has a strong influence on the meta mm -hmm. uh, just because they can be so polarizing. Especially gut leader. As we've seen. And Dargo, Dargo Kedis. And Dargo Kedis. Dargo in general. Yes. Very strong at putting pressure on life totals. But yeah. All right. Mr. Jonathan, last words. Last words. Nah, I don't have any last words. I think we can wrap it up there. Righteous. All right. Fellow data nerds out there in the internet lands. Uh, I hope that this style of metagame data analysis uh, is more to your liking, less less visuals and more discussion uh, based on our own perspectives, because uh, we're, you know, we collectively are, you know, watching parts of the meta as they happen. And of course, Jonathan's tracking every almost, well, Puzzle and I record games too, but Jonathan's tracking almost every single game that's coming in via the uh, uh, the form. So we're seeing it's all coming across the desk. So we're we're able to uh, take these cultural notes of what's happening at the time uh, that these interesting data points are occurring. So hopefully, this type of uh, commentary—that's the word I was looking for—is uh, more to your liking. And I don't know, maybe. Uh, Maybe a monthly thing, maybe a quarterly thing. This is kind of a quarterly thing, right? Yeah, I mean, we're on three months in now, and we reported on 
the last half of the year. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah, maybe we can make this a uh, a quarterly deal, so that way we have some meaty things to talk about. I know that we're going to employ employ this. Uh, we're going to tie this Bodarn guy up and never let him leave. So uh, hopefully, you'll be able to see some things being reflected in the website uh, here soon. So all right. Until the next time, friends, we'll see you later. See you all. Peace.